Hello all, welcome to the official EFL podcast and this week, to blow away the Winter Blues, we have Norwich's Samba star on the Canaries' playoff push. Step by step, uh, we are doing our job, we're trying to find our spot in the playoffs and my main target is, is to go to the Premier League with this club. From the boy from Brazil to the chap from Cardiff, Sky Sports' David Stowell is back as co-host and our latest 72 in 72 challenger slash victim is Cardiff's Callum O'Dowda. Do me a huge favour please and press the follow button on Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcast from so that you never miss an episode or you can watch the show on YouTube every single week. Let's get cracking. In case you hadn't realised, it's the official EFL podcast. So another week, another EFL podcast. David Stowell is alongside me for this one. And Stowell, you've been very busy. You've been all over the place covering all kinds of football, haven't you? All over the place is a phrase often used when talking about my commentary, I think. But um, yes, plenty of travelling the last uh, couple of weeks. Lots of teams have impressed me as well. Some really good performances up and down the country. So it's been uh, it's been fun. All part of the adventure. It is all part of the adventure. Uh, and I know that you would not have travelled as far as our guest this week. who's travelled from a different continent to play his trade right here <laughs> in English football at Norwich City. It's Gabby Sara, the Brazilian. Thank you so much for joining us, my friend. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. Thank you very much. You guys, it's a pleasure well, good. to talk to you. Well, good, thank you. It was a nice big beaming smile, Stanley, to get us up and running on the podcast this week. <laughs> We'd love to see it. And the beaming smile is there, Gabby, unbeaten in five in all competitions and just hovering outside the playoff places for Norwich City. It's safe to say you lot are very much in form. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, it's been a, a great run so far and uh, we are looking for a spot in playoffs, definitely. We have been fighting for that and we are really close now. Gabby, you, you are obviously a, a big part of what's happening at Norwich City and it's not just about the, the performances you're putting in but obviously the, the goals that you're scoring and creating. So how much fun are you having out there at the moment? Oh, it's, it's, it's really good now, I think. Uh, we are, I, I couldn't say like just for myself but for the whole squad, we have been, we have been much better now playing a good football and I think everyone's enjoying, even the fans uh, are enjoying the game. So um, it's have been really funny out there. You can tell by the look on your face, Gary, that you are really, really enjoying yourself. And given what Norwich City is uh, in English football, given the expectations from the fans, it, it's an noisy fan base. It's a packed out house every other week at Carrow Road. That must be one of the great thrills of playing in English football, that passion of the fans. Ah, oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, every home game is a crazy atmosphere, you know. <laughs> and uh, you you can see uh, how we play uh, at home games is it feels like different because I feel like we have one more player in the game. Mm -hmm. You can see the fans like so excited to see us play, and when we score, the noise and everything is is amazing. Gary, when when you play, you obviously, as we say, you play with a smile on your face. You've got that sort of infectious smile, if you like, we, we say in this country. Have you always been that sort of positive when you've played football and in life as well? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Uh, I think I got this from my dad. Uh, he used to say to me, when you do something with passion, you know, like if when you do something that you really love, you will be happy doing that, you know. So in life, if you, lo if you love life and if you love play football, you definitely will be happy doing this. So I think... I, I always try to do like this, you know, makes sense to me. It, I mean, it makes perfect sense the way you're describing it. I mean, not all of us could do the things that you can can do, Gabby, with the football. That's probably why you <laughs> find it so much fun. But, <laughs> but given, as I said at the top, um, football life and the life of a footballer is wonderful fun. It's a wonderful profession. Just give us a sense of what it's like geographically, though, because it's safe to say, I mean, you are a long, long way from home, aren't you? How have you found that? How have you found England? How have you found English football? Uh, it's quite it's quite good, to be fair. Um, the beginning was a little bit tough because of the language and everything and a new country and the weather. But uh, <laughs> I'd have started with the weather. The weather's yeah. the hardest thing to get out Yeah, of. definitely. It's the hardest thing. But to be fair, it's, it's quite good. The, the football here is more uh, physical and tactical. So uh, it's... it's it's a little bit different than Brazil, mm -hmm. but I I feel like I'll settle now, so I can enjoy myself here. Uh, the fans, they they 
they adopted me here like so well like a, like if I I was born here you know so I think a few things was easier to me and uh, and uh, I'm happy to to that I can enjoy football here it's it's amazing to play football in England the pitches are so good that atmosphere is amazing uh well, as I said, the the weather is not that perfect, but <laughs> I think the best football in the world is is in England now. So I'm really happy to be here. It's funny when you you move. I mean, I've lived abroad, and 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 I know that it's so important when you move abroad to a different country that people are there who you can enjoy spending time with. So you've been here now for eighteen months or so. Who sort of helped you settle in? Who were the people at the club who who really kind of welcomed you in and and, and got you into the fold? Everyone in the club uh, has helped me a lot. To be fair, um, since I came, the club got a, like a translator um, in the and uh, like the two first weeks. Uh, the guys from staff, the players as well. Uh, everyone is, is is such a nice club. It's, uh, the club like treats me like a family, you know. So every time I need something, I could call uh, anytime. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably I was a little bit annoyed with some guys in the club in the beginning <laughs> because I needed to uh, a lot of things, you know, it's, it's totally different for me, but um, I'm really glad for these guys. They they helped me a lot and definitely if I'm doing well and playing football or anything, they it's because of them. They, they really helped me. The, the thing that fascinates me, Gabby, about footballers that travel and go out of the way to kind of broaden their horizons in all senses of that of that description is it, language is so key isn't it and it's not necessarily about just about finding your way and being able to ask for the right things it's about being part of a group isn't it and being in a dressing room so the Sao Paulo dressing room would have been very easy for you to kind of immerse yourself in whereas in England there's different nationalities there's different um dialects, different languages, different ways of saying things as well. And the key part about feeling part of a group is that sense of belonging. And from the sounds of it, the, the way you talk, the way you deliver what you say, you've you've picked that up. I mean, this sounds a little bit condescending and I really do apologise for that, but th- these are the key things that really helps you settle into a dressing room. The, the I mean, banter is a word that's thrown around in England, isn't it? About being able to, to Mickey take and have a joke with your, with your teammates. But you seem to have absolutely settled in and picked it up pretty easily. Has it been as easy as I've just made it sound or has it been quite tough? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I agree with you, to be fair. Is, uh, the language is the key thing because uh, you, I don't think you are able to make like good friends if you don't mm-hmm. talk with them and to have a nice mm-hmm. conversation, make jokes and everything. And to be fair, for me, it was really hard. I really struggled in the beginning and sometimes I really struggle. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's getting easier every day, and I can have this conversation with you. I can have a conversation in the club. I can, I can, I don't know. I can go to watch a movie. It's it's make easier, you know. Yeah, but yeah. in the beginning, in the beginning, it was really hard. Uh, I had luck. My my fiance, uh, she could speak in English like when we came. So, but it was a little bit annoying, you know, because if you go to a shopping and I would try to buy some clothes. Was like I asked my fiance to oh say this to me, buy this to me, you know. So I was feeling like I'm not here with my my fiance. I'm here with my mom, you know. Oh, mom, please get this thing for me. But <laughs> now I can do these things by myself, and uh, I'm really glad for that because in the beginning it was really annoyed. But so, so you're dressing yourself now, just to confirm you. Oh yeah, you bought yourself. Okay. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> now now I can choose my own clothes. <laughs> but. It's, it's definitely the, the language is the key thing, definitely. Mm. And you are the first Brazilian to play for Norwich City, aren't you? When when Norwich City came calling, if you like, um, what sort of excited you most about the move to England, to a new challenge, to, to a, a new place? What, what what sort of got you really going about it? Um, I think the most exciting thing was to play in England the first time because it was always been my dream to play in England. And I remember I had a conversation with uh, Mariella, the scout, and she told me like the story about uh, Norwich and behind the Canaries and everything and mm-hmm. the colors and everything. And I felt like really attracted to me, you know, like I, I felt 
uh, maybe it's first step to go to play for my national team, you know, I don't know, it's something really close. Yeah. And when she, she told me about the, the city and the club, and I, I really feel interested. And when they came with the, the offer, I, I said, yes, like first time, because for me, it's, uh, to be fair, the, great, the greatest opportunity of my life so far. So I'm really happy to be here. We can, you, can, you get that sense of excitement as well. And, and, and given why you've come over here to um, further your career, to improve yourself when you talk about playing for the national team. And uh, us on this side of, of, of the globe, we've always looked over at Brazilian football with real respect and, and envy and a real passion to see. I presume conversely, that side of the world looks at the Premier League, how big the Premier League is, what the Premier League is about. So it's that first step with Norwich in the championship, but then it's that collective step with Norwich of getting promoted and given where you are just outside the playoff places, those final spots in the top six, are they the aim for yourself and Norwich City? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's the main target. Uh, in has been since I came, to be fair, uh, because <clears throat> I think in the last four or five years, they won two titles of championship and... They went to the Premier League and unfortunately they come down. And for me, when I came, I really thought about that. Like, we have to go to the Premier League. It's the main target. Before I go to my national team and I know how hard it is, how good their players are there. But my my, my, my first target is definitely go to the Premier League. Doesn't matter how, in the playoffs, directly. Uh, the most important thing is, is to be there. And when we go there, we stay there, you know, like... Mm -hmm. So step by step, uh, we are doing our job. We're trying to find our spot in the playoffs. And if you go to the playoffs, try to win. And after that, go to Premier League and try to stay there. And I think um, be more competitive that you can, because I think this is the most important thing in football. So yeah, my, my main target is, is to go to the Premier League with this club. Before, before we chatted today, Gabby, I, I touched base with a former teammate of mine that's on the coaching staff there, Andrew Hughes. So, Hughesy, you must know, very lively, very yeah. loud. I mean, the type of fella that when you're in a bad mood, you just need to tell him to calm down because he because he's a lot. The enthusiasm yeah. is wonderful. <laughs> it, he, he lives not too far from me up here. But he was very, very complimentary about, uh, first and foremost, your ability, the application that comes with that ability and the hard work and the dedication that you've got. So that must, I mean, uh, um, and I'm sure, David, as well, your boss, it speaks just as glowingly. I just don't know him as well. <laughs> but you've certainly made an impression on not just the fans, but the league itself. And you talk about historically what Norwich City are about. They're a very dominant force we've seen in the championship. And you're absolutely right. The aim, the size of the club, the way it's run, is built to play in the Premier League. Yeah, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, as I said, he was a funny guy, a nice guy. <laughs> And uh, I think I always been demanded for myself a lot uh, since mm -hmm. I came to Brazil, even when I was playing in Brazil. But in here, when I came, I felt like they were expecting so much things from me and from these guys, the, our club. Because if you see, like, the fans, they have so much fun in the last few years. Mm. Like, winning titles and being in the Premier League, seeing, like, big players playing here and... Now we are in the championship and you feel like the fans are excited again to go there again, to play in the Premier League. feels like, um, and since I, I'm here and um, I remember when my dad came and mm -hmm. he, he, he came for a few games and he said like, doesn't matter the weather, it's like, I think one, one game last season so far, he came to watch and it was like zero degrees and it's a lot for us, for Brazilian people, it's a lot. And... He said, like, there was, like, no uh, empty spaces in the stadium. Yeah. Everyone's mm -hmm. there, like, uh, supporting. And my dad said, like, it's unbelievable. Like, if I'm in Brazil, if I'm home and this weather, I love mm -hmm. football, but I'm not <laughs> here. I can watch from my TV, you know? <laughs> and he said, like, the fans, they are really excited for, mm -hmm. for, for football and they really support the team. So that's, that's marked me, you know, like, I, I thought, like, they're really expecting from us Something big, you know, like something that this team really deserve that yeah. go to playoffs or go to the Premier League and being the, the, the high spot, being like uh, the best version of this team can be, you know. 
So that's why I think every day in training and the game is we are thinking about the manner from ourselves and try to be the best we can do. And with, with that in mind, you talk about being the best version of yourself as a team, but as an individual, <clears throat> becoming the best version of Gabi Shara, who did you watch growing up? Who did you want to be? Because there are so many amazing <laughs> Brazilian footballers that surely must have caught your eye as a child. Yeah, definitely. There was a lot to be fair. Um, <laughs> but my dad, my dad always showed me some clips about guys that used to play in my position as well. But I think... Um, I think the guy that most marked me was Zidane, to be fair. Because I remember 2006, I was like seven years old. I didn't understand anything about football. Mm -hmm. And we were watching the World Cup in my house. And France plays plays against Brazil. And that time we had Ronaldinho, Kaká, Ronaldo, Adriano. We had like an unbelievable team, you know. So for me, it was like, we are going to win this World Cup, you know. Like, we know the other teams, they are amazing. Italy has a great squad, France as well, but we saw that team in Brazil and say like, wow, this is the team. And Zidane basically won that game alone. So I was like, who is this guy? It's unbelievable, you know, because I, I didn't know who, who he was. Hmm. So when I watch him play, I, I definitely say to myself, like, I have no idea what football is, but what this guy is playing is definitely football, you know. <laughs> and I think... I never thought I'd be like someone, but I think this guy, he definitely showed me like what's football, definitely. So after that, I, I started searching a lot of games uh, on the internet and I, in the past few years, I've been watching him play like old games. I can find some something in the internet, so I keep watching him play. And for me, this was like the, the best, to be fair, the best, like he was incredible. It's definitely hard to disagree with that because prime Zinedine Zidane was a very, very, very special footballer. Yeah. Um, let's just round it off, Gabby, because obviously we've talked about everything on the pitch. We've talked about you adapting to life in England and the potential of, of a real solid playoff run for Norwich City. But of course, at home, the greatest gift is coming very, very shortly. Um, your fiance is pregnant. You are not too far away from becoming a dad. Um, any trepidation about it any worries any concerns I mean you you strike me as a man that hits everything that comes his way in life with just a huge smile on his face and it is a wonderful <laughs> thing mate congratulations thank you very much yeah I'm so excited for that to be fair uh I don't know to be fair if I there's no worries it's just like um I'm always away you know so I'm always traveling or I'm always training and when I go home, I have to give some attention to my fiance. I have to give some attention to my dogs. I have three dogs. And you take them for the water walk on the beach, don't you, the dogs? Yeah, I take them to the beach. I take them to swimming, to the parks here in Norwich. So <laughs> I take them everywhere. And I think, like, with the baby, it's going to be one more attention to give, you know. <laughs> so, but, but it's going to be, it's, it's a good thing, you know. It's a good thing. I'm really excited the, the, for the, that, to be fair. The, the thing you've got to be very mindful of, given what we spoke about earlier in the conversation, is your wife buying outfits for both you and the baby, but it's a girl, <laughs> isn't it? So you won't have to wear matching outfits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, to be fair, when you go to the, 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 the stores now, I have to ask them to buy like for the baby, for me. <laughs> uh, well, Gary, congratulations, mate. We're going to let you go. I mean, thank you so much for giving thank us you very much, guys. your time. It's, it's been such a lovely chat. And, and as I said, if, if you're watching this on YouTube, We've just smiled all the way through because that's the aura that Gabby Sarah gives off. It's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful thing. Right, we're going to take a little break now on the official EFL podcast. Gabby Sarah is going to go off and be magnificent as he normally is. David Stowell is going to go and put his feet up and have a cup of tea. And we're going to listen to the 72 in 72 from Cardiff City's Callum O'Dowder. Hi, I'm Callum O'Dowder and this is the 72 in 72. Cardiff City, Swansea City, Newport. Cheltenham, Bristol City, Bristol Rovers, Plymouth Argyle, Exeter, Cheltenham, um, Oxford United, Ipswich, Norwich, um, Charlton, Port Vale, Barrow, Wrexham, uh, QPR, Hull City, Leeds, 
Lincoln, Doncaster, um, mine's gone blank, mine's gone blank, champ team, Sunderland, Southampton, Derby, Bolton, Chef Wednesday, not the old. Um, Shrewsbury Town. That was our latest 72 in 72. And for the eagle-eared amongst you, if that is a saying, uh, Callum O'Dowder tried to get away with two Cheltenhams. He double Cheltenham Stowley, which, as we well know, is a huge party foul. So we had to Stewart's strike one of on those that. off, yeah. which means he got a score of 26, which does put him in the top 10. Let's take a look at the table. Matt Smith at the top, unassailable, it seems, on 38. Richie Wellens behind him, 33. Then it's Danny Cowley. Pete Wilde, Wayne Rooney, Ebo Adams, Tom Bradshaw, John Coleman in 8th on 26, as is Callum O'Dowder in 9th on 26, Mark O'Brighton, 24, Joe Bryan just behind him, Lucas Djukovic, Liam Rossini, Matt Bloomfield, Andrew Moran, Valerian Ishmael, Alfie May, Gary Rowett, Stuart Dallas, Ruben Colwell, Stephen Fletcher, and propping up the league table as it stands is Callum's teammate Aaron Ramsey on 13. So Callum O'Dowder, Twice the guesser that Aaron Ramsey is. That's that up to date. Let's get <laughs> cracking with our EFL chat. And we're going to start in a division, David Stowell, which has been described thus. I love the championship. I watched Leeds versus Leicester last week. Wow. The football intensity in the championship is absolutely insane. So West Brom, they were a real football playing team. Ipswich as well. The league is incredibly difficult. Not my words, the words of Carabao Cup winning manager, Jurgen Klopp. There you go. There you go. He done. Knows his, Thanks uh... for joining us this week on the podcast. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he knows his football, doesn't he? So he there we does go. know his football. And he talks about that Leeds versus Leicester game, which for 75 minutes, if you're a Leeds fan, you're thinking, right, is it time to wave goodbye to Leicester City? Is that then the title taken? even though we are still in February. However, we had a final 10 minutes, which were uh, unlike anything we'd seen in, in recent uh, games. And by the end of it, it becomes Leeds United 3, Leicester City 1. Leeds fans singing uh, the longest version of the Kaiser Chiefs I put it to right I've ever heard, but was a beautiful thing to see in the flesh. There were limbs all over the place and Leicester probably heading home, scratching their heads, wondering how on earth did that all happen? Can you make any sense of it, please? Not really. No, I think that's the championship, isn't it? That's why we love it. That's why we love covering it. Uh, you, you kind of look at games like this. I know we talk a lot in football. Well, people talk in cliches a lot and say this is a six point or this is a six point. That that was a a game which literally, as you say, could have been title title over. Um, which which doesn't just mean the title is gone potentially, but mm-hmm. one of those two automatic spots is gone. Is it? You, you think about these teams; they're all fighting to get to the Premier League. They'd love to win the title, but the title isn't necessarily the thing that's foremost in their mind. It's about mm-hmm. being in those top two spots, isn't it? Ideally, winning the playoffs would be great, but you kind of don't want the stress of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, if Leicester were to win that game, then you start looking at it and thinking, well, they're going to get one of those two spots quite possibly the title, and and that's that. Three goals in 10 minutes and everything changes. And the lead now down to six points. Not only are Leicester catchable points-wise now, Mm -hmm. the goal difference is is so close. Only four goals difference between Leeds and Leicester in a goal difference sense. And, of course, there's the mentality side of it, isn't there? Momentum and all of that. When you've lost a, a couple of games and you look over your shoulder and there's a team in amazing form behind you chasing you down, how do you react? And we often talk on this podcast, indeed throughout the football world, about it's not about the setbacks, it's about how you react to them. And this is the challenge now for Leicester City this season. This is their biggest challenge of the campaign. And I must say, plaudits to Leeds, to Ipswich, to Southampton, Mm. because everyone has raved about Leicester City this season, and rightly so. It's all been about, will they catch Reading's record points total? Can they go through the season unbeaten? Can they do all these questions? But those teams are right there with them. And so we must give them great credit for that, particularly Leeds, who lost to Preston on Boxing Day, then lost at West Brom on December the 29th. You probably thought, have they got 
the mentality for this? Have they got the ability yeah. to win? Their response, nine straight league wins. They've <laughs> scored 22 goals and only conceded two. So Staggering stuff. We, we have a title race on our hands. We have a really good promotion race on our hands. Mm-hmm. And it just bodes so well for the division, for the neutral, and, and you know for, for the coverage in the weeks ahead. So it's officially on declares David Starr, which is wonderful. Ipswich <laughs> did their thing, so they're level on points with Leeds. Let's not forget that. And again, we've mentioned the teams in and around it that have set this pace, but Ipswich, an unbelievable job that Kieran McKenna keeps doing with his team. Southampton, surprising. They are now five points behind Leeds and Ipswich. I mean, two surprising things with this particular game, the fact that Southampton lost against a Millwall side that hasn't been getting the results potentially that they're performances deserve and in the Millwall dugout was Neil Harris which which one was more surprising for you Stanley? Yeah two things to pick out there really aren't there I mean the the, the Southampton thing first I mean they, they went 25 games unbeaten in mm-hmm. all competitions an amazing run and some wonderful football in there as well and let's not forget this is a team at the beginning of the season who couldn't string two passes together out of defence it was all going horribly wrong and it, it shows the contrast in these seasons uh, in the chat around certain teams that we've had. You know, a few games into his reign, mm. there are Southampton fans saying, get Russell Martin out of the club. Now there are people saying, or at least before this run of defeat, some people saying they could win the title, they could get into the into the top two. Um, it's obviously gone wrong the last few games, three defeats in four, but Russell has shown his ability to manage the squad to put across a whole new different brand of football, if you yeah. like, to them. And I uh, I'm I'm not concerned about them in the sense of of them picking the form back up, but it is worth noting March the fifteenth uh, they have Leicester City away, so we're talking two weeks time. That's going to be <laughs> an interesting one. They've also got to go to Ipswich on the horizon as well, and they end the season at Leeds. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know that there are there are issues to to tackle for Southampton ahead, but you'd imagine because of the run they've been on they can mentally get back into the right space to get on the, on the on the treadmill again. The Millwall appointment of Neil Harris was interesting because they do say never go back. Um, an exception to the rule, of course, is Darren Ferguson, who's Peter Beside <laughs> playing some great football at the moment. Continually um, keeps going back. <laughs> yes. Um, I must admit it was, it was strange because he'd only been manager of Cambridge for 77 days. And we know, we know Neil from our work in, in the do. EFL circle. Um, and I think it's fair to say he's had high points in his managerial career, but he's also had some challenges. So to see him jump straight back into Millwall was perhaps something that didn't go down with well with all Millwall fans when maybe it was a move designed to to cheer up the place after a yeah. real struggle this season. But you can't argue with the the way that that, that first game has gone. Um the challenge now is to keep that going. And, and obviously, it's been a really difficult season for them. They sit one point above mm. that dreaded line and they need to get their act together because there are teams at the bottom who are getting their act together. So that win was oh so vital, really. Otherwise, they would have been in a, in a real spot of bother. We're going to come on to those in just a second. Uh, of course, I mean, we're talking about a lesser side that bounced back uh, in the FA Cup. We've got Leeds and Southampton both in the FA Cup as of time of recording games later on tonight so they could be very very busy indeed great win for west uh, western okay great for western supermatch we're talking about a great <laughs> win for preston against coventry on friday night they're now level on points with norwich city just outside the playoffs gabby sara once again you wonderful wonderful human being um they're, they're they're just just wonderful well just joyful to chat to him wasn't it and mm. and it goes back to what and i kind of said it tongue in cheek but i absolutely meant it if you could play football like, like he could you would be absolutely beaming from here to where when you play <laughs> football like i did it was grit your teeth and get on with it mate as you could <laughs> well attest to uh, Stelly. let's talk about those teams down at the bottom because for the first time since september the bottom three is a different makeup we've got a qpr side that have climbed out we've got stoke city side that have dropped in. The change made, obviously, for the Potters with Stephen Schumacher um, to facilitate, potentially, you would assume, looking upwards when he came in. Now, I mean, is there a real danger that they could be in severe trouble come the end of the season? Yeah, there is. Uh, and we, we often look at momentum, don't we, at a time like this in the season? And it's seven defeats in nine in all competitions mm. for Stoke now. Just three wins in 21. And... That's frightening form when you're 
on the slide like that and sides beneath you are waking up. Um, I think he's won three of 13 Stephen Schumacher in charge. And I, I it, it was a, a move that I wanted to succeed because mm. I like Stephen. He's a good guy. He was a terrific manager at, at Plymouth Argyle, which was a difficult job because he'd taken over from not quite his boss. That's not quite the right, right way of looking at it. But when Ryan Lowe left and Stephen took over, he could have easily gone with him and been the number two to... To, to Ryan, but he decided, no, this is my moment to step in. And it could have gone horribly wrong. Uh, and a successful team could have then crumbled mm-hmm. if he hadn't known what he was doing. But he stuck to his guns and he did really well with them. I saw this as an opportunity to move onwards and, and potentially move upwards. Of course, the irony is that Plymouth Argyle are now five points clear of Stoke City. So there's there's a footballing irony in there. Mm. But yeah, concerning for, for Stoke City, they, they, the interesting thing is the recent wins they had against Queen's Park Rangers and Rotherham are sort of keeping them in touch now, um, which which are important. Obviously, they've still got to play Huddersfield at home mm-hmm. and Sheffield Wednesday away, and those two <sighs> games could be massive to the team's um, concern. Given as well, down. new manager at one, and one that seems to be getting the tune out of Wednesday as well, doesn't he? And Danny Rowe. Yeah, yeah. And their, their next five games: Stoke, Borough at home, Leeds and Preston away, Norwich at home, Hull away. Now, based on the form table at the mm. moment. That that's a tough next five. Middlesbrough at home, arguably, on paper, and you know this is this is obviously not the way football is played, but arguably the easiest of of those games. The other ones are, are really tough. Um, Queens Park Rangers are covered in the freezing cold at Preston, first day of December. I remember and I said that. it was that uh, how so the game cold. went on. I'll never know, uh, but but it did, um, and they won Queens Park Rangers. And I said something along the lines of in commentary at the end, you know, something could be happening here under under Marty Cifuentes and. You know, this could be the the start of something for Queens Park Rangers, and they, they won the next game, and they didn't mm-hmm. win for five and a half weeks. <laughs> it shows how much I know. Uh, but now it's one defeat. Definition of something starting. Well, you know, well, over a true. broader stretch of time. Stick with me, guys. <laughs> so it's one defeat and seven for them now. Four wins, and they're out of the bottom three for the first time since September. So a delayed reaction to what I said, perhaps, but essentially mm. there's positivity there and, and it's only goal difference keeping them out of the bottom three, albeit, but uh, but th- they're starting to move, they're starting to feel a bit more confident mm. about it, yeah. Well, just as good as that race for promotion could be with the automatic spots, that battle down at the bottom, I mean, obviously Rotherham, it looks extremely tough for them, but Sheffield Wednesday, Stoke, QPR, Millwall, Huddersfield, I mean, you could go as far up to Blackburn in 16 on 39 points, Plymouth just a point above them in 15th, on 40. Let's get I spoke, stuck I spoke into... to a Cardiff City fan yesterday, oh. incidentally, and they're still scared. Really? And they're nine points clear of the drop. So, you know, I'm not saying all fans are, but that particular fan was, uh, very was thinking, we're not safe yet. So, you know, you could maybe go up there, but I, I don't I don't think so. I think it's up to Plymouth at 15th, yeah. Okay, okay. Right, moving into the top of League One. There seems to be a gap opening up. Pompey are seven clear of Derby. Bolton, back-to-back defeats, for them, it does leave them, though, level on points with Derby County, 66 apiece, and a game in hand. Barnsley, though, the form that they're in, they are two games in hand on the top two and 63 points. Peterborough, Stevenage rounding out that, and obviously Oxford just hovering outside on 57 points. Um, I mean, is, is this the season that we see Pompey do it? I mean, there's been so much chat. They're a huge football team. Obviously, I've got ties, historical ties to Southampton, so I'm not um, trying to rub any Pompey fans up the wrong way, given, obviously, where we see these two teams. But it's one hell of a football club. I mean, if, if you want to play football and really know what they think about you, <laughs> go to France and Park. Because <laughs> they're not backwards in coming forwards, but it makes it such a wonderful place to play football. And they deserve, don't they, to get back a foot back towards potentially where they believe they belong in the Premier League. Well, so many false dawns there. Mm. And and uh, I did a game earlier on the season down at Fratton Park. It's a wonderful atmosphere when, you, when you're down there. And I think they'll do it. Mm. I think they'll get up this season. Uh, and it will be very well earned if they do because of all the injury issues that they've had down there. Some, some horrible injuries, some bizarre injuries. Mm. But it's taken a lot of bodies away from their promotion push. But they're still up there. There's seven points clear. And you mentioned the games in hand for others. At this stage of the season, and we go into cliches again, but you'd rather have the points than the games, probably, when you look yeah. at, at the state of pitches at this time, even though they're much better nowadays than, than back in the day. But you're still you know, looking at the points total and, and clinging on to what you've got. And other teams are fluffing their lines at the moment. We, we look at last night, Bolton, Derby, Blackpool, all lost. Uh, 13,000 watched Derby, uh, Bolton lose at Wigan 
for example, a great great occasion there by all accounts, and Wigan turned up and did the business. Uh, Portsmouth had a wobble around Christmas time, didn't they? They, they only won one of six, but they've won six of eight since. So it's that sort of the way of, of getting out of trouble, turning on the style. And I think John Mussinia, we, we spoke to him early on in the season on the pod, didn't we? He's just got a way of, of sort of galvanising what he's got down there and, and, and sort of wringing everything out of the players uh, in, in certain matches. And they're, they're, doing the, they're getting the job done. Mm-hmm. Um, remaining fixtures, they, they've still got to play quite a few of those promotion teams. So this is where things could come unstuck for them or they could just accelerate away into the distance, uh, home games against Oxford, Barnsley and Derby and trips to Blackpool, Peterborough and Bolton. So it's in their hands. They've got the lead yeah. and they're playing everyone beneath, beneath them. If they can win a few of those, it's it's job done. Uh, that's, it's not escaping anyone at all that that top four are all former Premier League teams, but kudos once again to Peterborough getting back to it and Stevenage, the job that Steve Evans is doing there, he's... he's Talk about enjoying a football club. I mean, they absolutely love each other at this moment in time, don't they? You mentioned Charlton there. First win for them since November. Nathan Jones obviously leading the hopeful charge away from the relegation places. Uh, points deductions coming in at Reading's way puts them in 20th in the division on 36 points, just three points above Cheltenham. Carlisle propping up the division after obviously coming up uh, via the playoffs last season. Um, yeah, it's looking... It's never a dull moment, and I mean that with the greatest respect to Reading and, and what they're all collectively going through. Hopefully they've done enough and they continue to do enough between now and the end of the season to make sure that they're somewhere near safety. But once again, we talked about Daryl Clark uh, in the past, Cheltenham looking dead and buried when he took over, but he's given them a real fighting chance of getting somewhere near to safety. Right, let's take a look at League Two. And uh, for a long time, when we were discussing last night, uh, Stowley, about what we were going to talk about today. One result really was standing out, which was Forrest Green having scored after three minutes, getting into the 90th minute and beyond, and still being one up. Paul Mullin, the man that I think he scored a few goals for Wrexham. I think he's been a big part. I, I, you know <laughs> I mean, this, sometimes this type of stuff is sketchy, but a huge part, of course, a totemic figure for the Welsh side. A 93rd minute penalty which means they came away from Forest Green with a point. I mean, I can only imagine the reaction of Steve Cottrell to that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how frustrating is that when you are so, so close to a, to an epic result uh, and then it just disappears right at the end? And I know Wrexham had their moments in the game, had their chances mm-hmm. and things, but you think you're almost over the line and then 90 plus three. And, and you know when the ball's put on the spot and Paul Mullen steps up, <laughs> you, you, know, you know what's going to happen. So uh, really frustrating from a Forest Green point of view, first of all, because you know had they held on to that win, they'd only be one point adrift of safety, coming up right on the heels of Grimsby now at the foot of the table, albeit Grimsby have a couple of games in hand. But it would have made such a difference to keep those two points in house. Mm-hmm. And for Wrexham, obviously, contrasting, if they hadn't picked up that point, they'd then be uh, three points off, no, no, two points off um, crew in the final automatic position. So mm-hmm. they just needed to take something. At that stage of the game, they just needed to take something. And uh, yeah, uh, some 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 funny things happening in League Two. We, we often say that League Two can be forgotten about because of the sort of the glamour of the championship in EFL circles. And, and then League One has some of the former Premier League teams. But League Two can be a crazy place to be. And the picture can change so quickly at the top and the bottom. You talk Forest Green. We must talk Sutton, of course. Four Absolutely. three winners at Notts County, uh, and and so Sutton are now only four points adrift at the bottom, albeit having played more games than other teams. Um, and and people are losing their form at the top. Wrexham two wins in eight. Stockport one win in six. Mansfield and Crew the big beneficiaries, and they're really leading their charges at the table. Mansfield at the top now. Well, I mean, that's been the debate. Oh, sorry, not the debate, because there is no debate. It's been the chats over the course of the season. The size of the clubs, such as Stockport and Wrexham, uh, and we, as you head into the season, wondering what's going to happen. But the kind of old faithfuls, you know, the, the, the Mansfield Town under Nigel Clough, Crew Alexander, a footballing name for the ages in England, of course, given the institution of what it did uh, at high levels of football, really going up against some of the big boys in the second tier of English football. Um, so great work being done by them. You mentioned just then, of course, that Sutton result, but let's flip it to the other side of it with Notts County now sitting 14th, given 
the early season knockings of what we've seen, the expectations, of course, we'd heard about Notts. And they're a big, big football club, obviously. It's the, the grand old girl of, um, of English football. Where they are now and what you'd seen from them during the course of the season, did you expect them to be where they are in mid-table? Well, no, but the one thing I'd caveat with that is that 14th sounds miles off the pace, doesn't it? And in, indeed, in, in recent form terms, they are. Last 19 games, they've lost 12 of them. Hmm. So the form's been awful when you consider that you want to be a promotion-chasing team. Mm-hmm. And 14th sounds, as I say, miles away from anything. But they're only four points off the playoffs. So that just underlines League Two, doesn't it? And how how mad it is there at the moment that actually Bradford in 16th are only five points off the playoffs and have 13 games to play. Now, for a lot of clubs, if you'd said, right, you'll be five points off the pace with 13 games to play, would you mm. take that at the start of the season? Absolutely. You would, wouldn't you? Mm. So... The promotion race in League Two, arguably you could probably count Swindon out now, albeit Swindon fans might have a different opinion, and and, and that's that's cool. But they're eight <laughs> points off the playoffs with only that's 11 cool. games left. That's cool, gang. So that's, that's I, I would be, if Swindon get in the playoffs, fair play, they'll have absolutely deserved it. I would say the cutoff there is 16th. Mm. To think that there aren't still 16 teams mathematically in a promotion race, we're about to go into March. That's... That's mad, isn't it? That's why we why we love the EFL. That's why it we keep the, our eyes all over the EFL and, and, and League Two is fascinating. EFL, it's the gift that keeps on giving, isn't it? Um, Stowell, it's been a pleasure once again, my friend. Are you on your travels this week? Yes, I've got uh, a little bit of Premier League and a few bits of EFL and various other things going on. So yeah, lots of lots of miles to cover and hopefully lots of goals to see. I haven't actually seen a nil-nil since the 15th of April last year and we're uh, we're now Fate heading tempted. into March so well done. I'm trying to get a year under my belt without a nil nil let's see if we can do it some six there's definitely goals one coming your way mate hopefully. and now we've said it now the next game's ruined yeah, isn't it of course so. <laughs> just as as, as, a, as a very last uh, addendum to what we've been chatting about because I'd heard it uh, discussed on radio the other day you've got AFC Wimbledon up against MK Dons which does mean once again that Dean Lewington is putting his boots on for I think the millionth time. <laughs> the 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 record setting uh, appearances that he's done for one club in MK Dons is just phenomenal. I just wanted to give Dean a shout out. I've, I've got his number. I, I, I mean, I'm meaning to text him as we always do. I, I'll, I'll text that fellow. I'll say well done. But just on here, just to give him uh, kudos as as a bona fide EFL legend. That is a phenomenal return of games, and he's. Uh, Still going strong, of course. Uh, so we wish him continued success. We wish you continued success, David Stell. Thank you and for joining you, me, Mr. Prutton. Always a pleasure. Never a chore. And it really isn't a chore with the charming David Stell. That's us for this week. A huge thank you to David, to the sunshine superman himself, Gabby Sara, and Cardiff's Callum O'Dowder. Please do give us a follow wherever you get your podcasts or watch it all right here on YouTube. My name's David Prutton, and I'll see you same time next week for another wonderful episode of the official EFL podcast.